Welcome to the MegaCast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. Today, we'll be talking to a number of people about topics of interest and importance to Michiganders just like you. Let's get started with what's happening uh, around the state and what's making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page. Our top story comes from Chandra Fleming at the Detroit Free Press. Slow down. Okay, yeah, I'm talking to you, Mr. Leadfoot, Lady Speed Racer, Bill the Bus Driver, all of you. One, for your safety and for the safety of everybody else on the road, but also, at the very least, because the state police are upping their enforcement of speed limits aimed at reducing the number of crashes, deaths, and injuries due to speeding on Michigan roads. According to a news release earlier this week, these kinds of dangerous incidents have been increasing since the pandemic, sparking the increased enforcement happening now through February 28th. In a news release, Katie Bauer, the director of the Michigan Office of Highway Safety Planning, said the goal is to save lives by addressing risky behaviors on the road, in particular, speeding. Quote, speeding continues to be a critical issue in Michigan that leads to many needless injuries and crashes and fatalities on our roadways. With the arrival of winter comes snow, slush, and slick road conditions that make speeding even more dangerous and crashes more likely, in closed quote. Between 2020 and 2021, according to statistics, traffic crashes in Michigan rose by 15%. Also making headlines, and finally making headlines today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page, this time from Samuel Dodge at MLive. The Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office yesterday explained why it took seven weeks for a University of Michigan defensive tackle and star player Mozzie Smith to be charged with a felony weapons charge stemming from an incident that occurred on October 7th. Many have compared this situation to that of Imani Bates, an Eastern Michigan basketball star from Ypsilanti, whose weapons charges in September were authorized the day after his arrest by Ann Arbor police. So what was the difference? Why one outcome for Mozzie Smith of the University of Michigan versus Imani Bates for EMU. The key difference, according to Washtenaw County Prosecutor Eli Savitt, is where the arrests occurred and the deadlines to authorize those charges, as well as how these individuals were detained for their alleged crimes. In Bates's case, he was arrested and detained overnight, which comes with a state law requirement of 24 to 48 hours following such detainment uh, of a deadline to authorize charges and arraign the detainee on any of those charges. In Mozzie Smith's case, he was arrested and released while charges were pending, eliminating such a requirement at the state level, uh, at which uh, Prosecutor Savitt had said, this is more of a normal process in that situation for things to you know, take maybe a few weeks to, uh, to come together and ultimately result in charges and then an arraignment. Smith was, a, was in possession of a handgun while his concealed weapons permit was pending. This was discovered at a traffic stop when he was pulled over at 9.35 p.m. on October 7th by Ann Arbor police. He was in possession of, of the weapon that he was seeking a, a permit for, according to this article, without a valid concealed weapons permit and without his driver's license. Again, he was in the process of getting his concealed weapons permit uh, but did not, but again, did not have it at the time while in possession of this weapon. Direct from the article, quote, University of Michigan Athletic Director Ward Manuel said in a statement that Smith was, quote, honest, forthcoming, and cooperative on the incident from the very beginning and is not suspended from the team at this time. Quote, he is not and never has been considered a threat to the university or the community, and closed quote, Manuel said in a statement. Continuing on, the University of Michigan Athletic Director said, quote, based on the information communicated to us, we will continue to allow the jud judicial process to play out. Mozzie will continue to participate as a member of the team, and closed quote. Also making statements on this incident uh, this week, Michigan head football coach Jim Harbaugh said in a statement that he has, quote, respect for our judicial process, and with that respect brings confidence that a fair and just resolution is forthcoming, and closed quote. One day following his arrest, Mozzie Smith traveled with the University of Michigan football team to Bloomington, Indiana for their game versus Indiana University. He was not suspended as a result of the arrest at that time, played several games beyond that, and as was stated earlier on in this article, as we said, both Jim Harbaugh, the head coach of the Michigan football team, as well as Ward Manuel, the athletic director at the University of Michigan, said there are no plans as of now 
to suspend him either for this weekend's Big Ten championship game occurring on Saturday or presumptively the college football playoff, uh, of which it's most likely the University of Michigan will participate in regardless of the outcome on Saturday evening in Indianapolis. That being said, we talked about this a little bit yesterday at the end of the mega cast, the situation between uh, the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office and the players from Michigan State involved in what's known as, quote unquote, tunnel gate uh, that, that happened in the tunnel at the big house following Michigan State's loss to the University of Michigan in October. In that case, uh, charges were brought down by the prosecutor's office, severe charges in the case, in the case of Kari Crump facing a felony assault charge. Uh, and and you know, that also took a few weeks to develop, but the, the prosecutor's office had made statements almost immediately after that incident within just a couple of days, stating that his office planned to do a full investigation and make charges if needed. In this case, charges were brought against Mozzie Smith of the University of Michigan. However, the reaction seems to be much more relaxed and much less pointed than it was in the case of Michigan State University. That's from an optics standpoint. As far as we know, from the information that we have on this, this was taken as seriously as any other case from the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office. Until we know more information that states otherwise, we have to be under that presumption that they did take this seriously, that they didn't drag their feet on this. But as we also identified, Eli Savitt does have ties to the University of Michigan. He has been very vocal, particularly on social media in the past, before Tunnelgate, before this situation, about his fandom, his appreciation, for the University of Michigan, his affiliation with the University of Michigan as a law professor as well. And so this becomes a bad look for his office that these charges took seven weeks to come together after an October 7th arrest. It also looks really bad for the University of Michigan, especially for head coach Jim Harbaugh and, and athletic director Ward Manuel, who were so adamant about suspensions, potential criminal charges, and more uh, and more reprimanding that was to happen after the incident for those football players at Michigan State, as well as for Michigan State University. If it happens to another team or by another team, it seems to be at the University of Michigan that needs to be taken seriously and be dealt with right away and be dealt with quite harshly. But when it happens inside their own house, it seems to be a little bit more relaxed. In the case of Mozzie Smith, do what? Uh, from all we have on this case and all we have on the, on the information here, he is not a threat to the public. He did nothing wrong with that weapon other than, other than possessing it without his concealed permit license being through the process and, without, and driving and speeding without having his license on him. Much different than video evidence than us seeing very clearly the acts that happened by the players at Michigan State University. All that being said, a really bad look for the University of Michigan that this wasn't a brought up immediately at, and addressed immediately after the incident occurred in October and B that no action was taken and C that even after the charges have been brought upon Mozzie Smith, there seems to be no action being taken against this individual for making a mistake when that standard seemed to be much higher for other kids of his age and his maturity level at another university. All those headlines are making news today on CivicCenterTV.com's local news page. Find more information, CivicCenterTV.com. We have a great show on this Friday edition of the Megacast. After this very short break, we'll have our weekly mental health talk with Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. I'm feeling good. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. My Michigan TV is streaming everywhere on Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, and more smart TV apps. My Michigan TV is on your phone too. Take us with you wherever you go. Just search for My Michigan TV on your favorite app store or visit mymitv.com. All Michigan, streaming everywhere. My Michigan TV.
Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can learn more about our program. Keep up to date with us on demand as well at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We'll also find links to more information on original programming from all of our partnering stations all across the state of Michigan. Joining us now on the Megacast is therapist Carrie Craywick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic. Joining us for our weekly mental health talk. Carrie, thanks for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Good to have you with us as always. And uh, we're coming off the Thanksgiving holiday and approaching the end of the year holidays now. And this holiday season, so often when people get into the season, they're thinking about those gift giving holidays, those uh, party throwing holidays, all of which make people then also go right back to thinking about their finances at the end of the year, because this is a very, uh, a very tough time of the year for so many people, and especially as you're doing holiday shopping, as you're hosting your family, as you're traveling to visit family or to visit friends this, this time of the year, there's a lot of financial pressure that, that can be put on you. And that can have a, a number of different mental health effects. Just how severe uh, do we see this being a problem year after year when we get to this time, Carrie? Sure. So there's a, there's a many things at play. I think you really, you know, started to set it up about, you know, right, there's a lot of things that motivate people to spend money this time of year, things that they feel like they can't perhaps avoid, whether it's travel or gift giving. Um, and then um, the guilt and anxiety about what they are and are not able to do may also contribute. People may try to conceal some things that are going on with them that seem like problems by putting on a big facade of perfection. Um, which of course can involve spending money. Um, people can have relationship issues in which they're maybe concealing spending from their spouse, something that's called financial infidelity. Um, but it is a form of cheating just like any other and can be exceptionally damaging to a relationship. So there's a lot of things that really fuel that hyper spending. I mean, also buying things, getting things, giving things feels good. So it can also become a bit addictive um, and you get a little buzz from it. But then like any buzz, there's the after effect, which can be really damaging. So wh where should people be starting when they're approaching their finances this holiday season, the way that, that, that their finances are affecting their mental health. What are those first steps you suggest or that others in the mental health community would suggest for them to take to make sure that you know, when these issues do arise, they aren't you know, causing, them, uh, causing them mental health problems or uh, undue distress? So I know I sound like a broken record when I say this, but one of the things that I often bring up is happiness equals reality minus expectations. So that being said, that the closer your expectations are to the reality, you're gonna end up with a surplus of happiness. If your expectations keep taking it away, you're gonna end up in debt. And the same goes with your finances. So the first thing I think people can do is really evaluate what makes a perfect holiday season. And if perfect isn't really the right word, even a complete holiday season, start with brainstorming what are your goals and what are the things that go into it? So is it baking with family? Is it traveling to see family? Is it buying a unique gift for each person? What are all of the features of a, of a great holiday and set your goals up? What's, a, what's your super big unrealistic goal? what's a maybe you know pretty good goal and what's like our baseline of what we probably can achieve and then pick just a few of the things you've thought of and start there so instead of trying to create the whole menu look at what you have and scale to what what you think you can do so much of those expectations come from other people they're not your internal expectations that you do when you do that self-inventory and you really look at the broad broad scope of things as you just suggested so what what are your suggestions in terms of uh, of dealing personally with those outside expectations both directly with the people that may be you know, putting that pressure on you purposefully or not uh, or just uh, internally dealing with that too to relieve those those stresses before they become problematic 
I, I love that you brought that up. Certainly we get a lot of external pressures, but perhaps a lot of them aren't intentional or intentionally aware of the pressure they feel. That is internal. So it is a balance between what are our, what are we assuming is the intention of someone else's expectations and how are we assuming we respond if we let them know that that that's not really a place that we can achieve right now. And so, you know, one thing too I often say is take time and space. Don't just give a blanket yes you know, to every single person or every single thing that's asked for you. Um, let them, let the, you know, requester know you need time and space to kind of see where it fits in the entire scheme of how you'd like to spend your holiday, spend your time and spend your money as you're moving through this year and offer alternatives, right? And so instead of also writing just a blank check, no, um, consider, you know, I can't do this thing with you. Like, you know, I don't want to do dinner and cocktails with friends. I don't have the time or the money um, to allocate to that, but I'd love to take a morning walk. Would you like me to meet at your house and bring coffee and we can spend some time together that way? Like you're allowed to make alternatives that work for you. And if they decline those, that's okay too. We're joined by Carrie Kwewick from the Birmingham Maple Clinic on today's edition of the Megacast, our weekly mental health discussion with Carrie and the team at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. More information can be found on their website, BirminghamMaple.com. BirminghamMaple.com is their website for more information and to get in contact with them for services as well. And, and uh, Carrie, there, beyond all of that too, there are other people involved that can also, in these, these sorts of situations, that can also provide help to individuals that may be under stress, particularly from their finances, and the ways that those are impacting them this holiday season. From someone on the outside looking in, oftentimes you know, we don't know about these issues, but in some cases we do know that someone in our family or our friends may be going through a rough financial time. And uh, what, what are your suggestions for those individuals of how they can approach a situation uh, with their loved one, whether it be about you know, going out and grabbing uh, dinner and drinks with them or you know, traveling across the country to visit a family member or family members for the holidays in a way that is sensitive to this individual's or these individuals' situation or situations, but not condescending or a way that could come off belittling to these individuals. Sure, I think if, if you are aware, now there may be many cases, of course, with the advent of credit cards, people are able to conceal at least much of their debt publicly, <laughs> privately, they know they may know they're carrying it. Um, but if you are aware of something, certainly offer a range of opportunities, kind of the same thing, like, how, how would I like to spend my time with this person? Shoot your big lofty goal, and then maybe offer a medium and maybe like a more basic goal. And so, right, we might not be able to achieve the whole thing, um, but at least it gives the other person choice of whether, where, where they see themselves fitting. I mean, I think, like you said, whether it's, whether it's mental illness, substance abuse, relationship distress, financial distress, all of us know at least one person in our immediate or extended family dealing with if not one or more of those. So I think so often the assumption if you're the person carrying one of those issues is that you're the only one and nobody knows or if it exists in your family that your family somehow the only one and nobody knows what you're dealing with or going through. But the reality is that everybody's dealing with something um, and everybody knows someone who is dealing with one of these variety of things. Um, so having that just kind of awareness that, um, you know, that that there is some barrier, it's not just a dislike or a resistance or whatever, it, even if the barrier is private, um, it's still real and important and, and um, shouldn't be diminished or discouraged, should just be understood and, and perhaps left as an avenue to say, look, I know you're not telling me the barrier, but at any point, if you'd like to talk about what's keeping you from traveling or this or that, you know, I'm here to listen as opposed to trying to strong an arm and say, oh, it's no big deal. What are you talking about? Just say like, you know what, I can't figure out what it is, but I'm, I'm here for you if you ever did want to share with me or needed to talk about it in some more detailed way. More information can be found on BirminghamMaple.com about getting in contact with the professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. You can also call them 248-646-6659, 248-646-6659. 
for more information. We're joined by Carrie Krawick, a therapist at the Birmingham Maple Clinic on today's edition of the Megacast. Carrie, a couple more minutes with you today before we'll say goodbye. As we look at the holidays, even beyond uh, this particular topic of financial stresses and the mental health stresses that they can, that they can lead to uh, or exacerbate, uh, we, we think about the holiday seasons, and so often there is a certain magic to it. Uh, there's uh, there's this fancy there's this fanciful nature that comes along with the holiday season, with the snow outside, with the warm feelings you get from being with family and friends. And for a lot of people, uh, whether they are in situations where they do have their family and their friends in the, in their life or not. For many individuals, that can be a, this can be a really tough time of the year for them to navigate and can be really stressful for them for a number of reasons as they also do their reflecting before the, so to speak, clean slate of a new year. What do you, what, what do you say to these individuals or what are suggestions that you or other mental health professionals may have for these individuals on you know, navigating some of those uh, regular and, and, and perfectly normal holiday blues? Sure. Yeah, there's so many things, right? Because it's also a very fast time. So there's a lot of effort yeah. and a lot of energy. And then it just feels like it's just sort of gone before you knew it. And um, it's hard to sort of enjoy and take it all in. So there's a lot of contributors, you're right, the comparing um, to other people. And then certainly just, you know, people with, say, for example, diagnosable depression. Um, it's also a time where we start to see the onset of seasonal affective disorder, which is um, the depressed mood that comes from um, the darker days and the, the change in our, in our season and our exposure to um, sunlight. Um, but Right. So it is it is a normal experience. And to keep that in mind, I think a great rule of thumb, right, is like depression isn't feeling sad when everything is sad. Depression is actually feeling sad when things are seem to be happy and that and you're feeling depressed anyways. And so it is normal. Um, you know, if you are feeling sad, despite a lot of evidence to feel good, perhaps to be evaluated for um, perhaps a depressed mood. Um, that being said, these holiday seasons also come with other things like loss and grief, um, you know, thinking about things that were, were people who used to be present or not, or traditions that have changed, um, and to allow yourself time and space across the month that um, it's okay to have mourning, it's okay to grieve, it's okay to have sadness and memories, that all of, all of our feeling states are acceptable. I think that's another thing that people forget that, you know, that somehow some feelings are off limits, like we should not feel sad this time of year. You know, I always think should is another word we should stay away from. Um, and instead, of, of course, we would feel sad. We don't have to feel only sad and we don't have to feel only happy, but that that the whole spectrum should be available to us at any given time. If anyone is present and all of the rest are sort of taken away, then that's a cause for pause and perhaps to speak to a therapist or a doctor and um, get evaluated for treatment in some way. Carrie, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us as always. Thank you for having me. BirminghamMaple.com is the website for more information. Get in contact with Carrie and the other professionals at the Birmingham Maple Clinic. We'll take a break on the mega cast. Up next, plenty affecting our market from railway strikes to uh, issues in China, as well as uh, continued uh, continued uh, out, outlandish behavior from Elon Musk, now going to battle with another major major corporation and major uh, company on the world scale. We'll talk about all of that and more with Michael Greiner from Oakland University coming up next on the Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Wondering what to say to someone who's been sexually assaulted or abused? I believe you. I'm so sorry this happened. It's not your fault. Confidential and anonymous help is available at the Michigan Sexual Assault Hotline. Connect with us 24-7. Call 855-VOICES-4 or text 1-866-238-1454 for help. Learn more at michigan.gov voices 4. 
what's happening around you. Hear about state events, businesses, and from the people behind them on The Megacast, an hour-long TV, radio, and streaming show keeping you informed on the day-to-day -day news. Listen in on talks with volunteer groups, documentarians, and financial advisors Monday to Friday with your host, Tyler Keeft. Catch The Megacast weekdays from 10 a.m. to 11 on Civic Center TV, 89.3 Lakes FM, and streaming on MyMyTV.com. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show looking into all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keeft. Learn more about our program by visiting civiccentertv.com slash megacast, where you'll find more information on all of our partnering stations across the Great Lakes State, including My Michigan TV, and find all of our full shows and each individual interview on demand. Civiccentertv.com slash megacast is the place to go for that. The place to go for information on what's happening in the markets and how that's affecting your pocketbooks and those around the world is right here every Friday with Michael Greiner from Oakland University. Michael, thanks for being with us again. Oh, it's great to be back. I missed you guys last week. Yeah, we missed having our, our weekly discussion, a brief hiatus for the break, but the, <laughs> uh, the economy and the world did not take a break in the markets over that no, past week. Not. Plenty going on now that's affecting both our economy here in Michigan and in the U.S. and the economies all across the world. Let's begin with what's happening uh, here domestically. A big story uh, of late this week has been Congress stepping in to uh, mediate a situation between railroad unions and their workers to avoid a strike. And this is not a new story. We've heard something. We've heard rumblings about this in the past. Just a few months ago, there was also an another uh, near miss situation with a strike on the rails and in this case uh, another uh, another uh, tough situation to navigate that could potentially have significant impacts on the US economy. Yeah, I think we actually talked about this back when the deals were first negotiated and it was a real yeah. victory I think for the White House and for the administration that they were able to step in and without imposing a deal upon the unions and the and the railroads that they were able to negotiate a deal which everybody had accepted. The problem is, though, that when those deals were taken to the actual railroad employees to ratify the agreements, well, there are 12 unions of railroad employees, and as it turns out, eight of them ratified it, four of them did not. Uh, the ones that did not, it was actually kind of a close vote, generally speaking, uh, but the bottom line is it, it appears that most of the employees had ratified it, but all the unions agreed that if any union strikes all of them would strike. So basically, it created the situation where even though the union leadership had accepted the deal, um, most of the unions had accepted the deal, it appeared most of the employees had accepted the deal, uh, unfortunately, it appeared that we were going to have a strike with the railroads anyway. Uh, so despite the fact that the, uh, that the president's kind of positioned himself as being a pro-labor leader, and Congress, of course, is controlled right now, uh, at least for a short time longer, uh, in both houses by Democrats, uh, who tend to be more pro-labor than Republicans. Um, they felt the need to step in and stop the strike from happening. Now, interestingly enough, the uh, although we there has been some griping on on the part of the unions about it, uh, generally speaking, that complaining has been relatively limited because of the fact I think that the the labor unions tend to understand that the administration helps them get just about the best deal that they could under the circumstances. Now, the behavior of the railroads, frankly, uh, is pretty questionable. I mean, part of the reason that this became an issue at all was because of the, the fact that the railroads have tried to increase their profits by decreasing the number of employees they have. And that's resulted on huge burdens on the employees being called in all kinds of crazy hours and their schedules being up in the air all the time uh, and them not being allowed sick leave. In fact, there's the example of one railroad employee who deferred getting a doctor's appointment and died as, of a heart attack because he had to work. Uh, so you can see where the railroad employees are upset, but the problem is the way the system is set up right now, there is this balance. And uh, uh, it appears that uh, under the circumstances, the unions got about the best deal they could and basically what happened is Congress just said, look, you need to accept this deal because it's not going to get any better than this. We're joined by Michael Greiner from Oakland University on today's edition of the Megacast. You can find more information on all the programs at Oakland University by visiting their website, oakland.edu. Michael, uh, on, another, on another topic, a couple that are actually 
uh, somewhat related. FTX, of course, the cryptocurrency uh, company uh, has filed, or the cryptocurrency exchange has filed for bankruptcy. Uh, and as it files for bankruptcy uh, the, and, and begins the process, many of its assets are essentially missing in action. And similarly, in the case of uh, Alex Jones, who was sued by uh, the, fam the families of the victims of the uh, school shooting at Sandy Hook, uh, Sandy Hook Elementary School, uh, and, and they won that lawsuit. Then he started to move some of those some of those monies around uh, in, in a quite strategic way. So as a former bankruptcy attorney yourself, how are these situations both similar, and what can be done to uh, to either counteract them or, or claw back at least some of those or all of those missing funds in both of those cases? Yeah, I'll tell you a story. Back when I was a practicing bankruptcy attorney before I got into academia, I used to frequently have clients come into my office and, you know, I'd have to tell them sometimes, oh, you know, you have more assets than you can file bankruptcy for without having to give up some of your assets to your creditors. And inevitably, inevitably, the response I would get from those uh, uh, from those clients was, oh, well, can't I just give that asset to my brother friend, relative, you name it. And uh, I always had to tell them the same thing, which is they've figured this out. Uh, this is not some new idea that you've come up with. In fact, the law that deals with this issue dates back to the 1500s in England, actually. Uh, and uh, what they call it is what's called a fraudulent transfer, where basically uh, if you have given assets to somebody when you're uh, when you're insolvent, which means that you've got more debts than you've got assets. When you give when you give some of those assets to somebody uh, for what's called less than reasonably equivalent value, then uh, then what can happen is the creditors can basically go and take those assets back and bring them back uh, in the into what's called the bankruptcy estate to distribute them to the creditors. So a classic example of that, actually, you mentioned the Alex Jones case, uh, and a great example of that is as this litigation was proceeding, and it was becoming clear that he was in serious trouble on this because he had basically lied about what had been going on at Sandy Hook. The uh, uh, Well, what happened is he started paying his personal trainer $100,000 a week to engage in shipping and uh, receiving for his company. You have to remember, the biggest source of Alex Jones's money is not his podcast that he has or his videos that he makes, but actually he hawks these vitamin supplements on his shows uh, and uh, many of his uh, followers are big believers in them so he makes a lot of money off of selling those well the person who is doing shipping and receiving for that now is earning a hundred thousand dollars a week well i think most people sitting out there and i can tell you my daughter's boyfriend is actually someone who works in shipping receiving and i'm pretty sure he does not receive a hundred thousand dollars a week compensation for his services so that would be a great example of somebody receiving uh funds uh in excess uh, of what the what the value is that they're receiving so uh that would be the type of thing that the creditors would be able to go and say uh to the uh, to this um, uh, shipping receiving slash personal fitness guru uh, to say, hey, you need to pay back those funds that were given to you uh, as much as over the last six years, you'll have to give them back to us so that they can be given to the creditors who deserve to have this money. And the creditors in this case, of course, would be the Sandy Hook families who, uh, who were essentially lied about uh, and who won these lawsuits. And it's the same thing, by the way, that we're starting to see with Sam Bankman Freed uh, with the FTX case. Well, we talked about FTX, I think, last time we were together and how crypto is basically falling apart. And uh, in this case, though, it turns out that Sam Bankman Freed was shifting some of his assets from one company over to another company prior to its collapse. And in fact, that probably is what led to the collapse of FTX when people kind of got wind of that. So uh, again, this is the type of thing where all the creditors, all the people who are owed money by FTX because they deposited money into FTX to buy cryptocurrency, and now FTX doesn't have the money to pay them back, well, they're going to be able to go and sue either Sam Bankman Freed or these other companies or these other individuals that these funds went to to try to get those funds back so that the creditors, the people who've been defrauded, are able to get some money back on what they're owed. 
Now, in most cases, unfortunately, the people who are owed money are not going to get 100% of what they're owed, but at least if they get something, it's better than nothing. And that's kind of what the goal of this law is. So I think it's fair to say that efforts to kind of skirt these judgments, people frequently engage in them, but rarely are they successful. So uh, that's one, one sign of good hope, I think. You can always find more information on uh, the School of Business Administration programs at Oakland University by visiting oakland.edu. We're joined by one of the assistant professors of management at Oakland University School of Business Administration, Michael Greiner, as always, on this Friday edition of the Megacast. Uh, and uh, Michael, another, another story this week as we continue to talk about the uh, oddities of Elon Musk's uh, Twitter <laughs> regime. This week, uh, or recently, going after Apple this time, as Apple uh, ha had started making rumblings that they were going to remove the Twitter app from the app from the App Store. Elon Musk then uh, making claims that Apple is trying to censor Twitter, in particular Elon Musk, because uh, of his beliefs and, and some of the things that he says and that, that are said on Twitter. And uh, I think uh, Tim Cook had a really, really interesting uh, and for me funny reaction to it when uh, when he's brought up the idea of so we're censoring people but you're requiring uh but we're also apparently required <laughs> to speak on your app tell us about this situation because these are two major companies going up against each other toe to toe and this currently a war of words but potentially something that could have a big impact on the twitter app that's pulled from one of the largest app stores in the world Ah, yes, Elon Musk. You know, I was reminded of the show Super Pumped. A lot of people out there might have watched it as well. Uh, the story of the Uber founder, Travis Kalanick, and what he and kind of the machinations he went through. And one of the scenes in that show involved him basically going to Tim Cook at Apple and begging forgiveness for violating the terms of the Apple store. Because so many people, uh, in fact, I think the source, the largest source of people getting apps on their on any phone uh, is the App Store in Apple. And if you basically get on the bad side of Apple, they can ban you from that store. And uh, all of a sudden, you're in bad shape. You're, you're essentially your app stops existing. Uh, and Uber was well aware of that, which kind of resulted in uh, Kalanick going to Apple and begging forgiveness for uh, violating their terms. Uh, and I think that the same thing actually happened with uh, with Elon Musk, where literally the day after he posted these tweets, uh, he's posting something else saying, oh, he went to Apple and Tim Cook gave him a tour of the campus and all is well now. Uh, so I think it just shows, though, that uh, Elon, frankly, is doing a little bit of flailing. Uh, and that's really what's going on here. And the problem is, as we've talked about before, that when he took over Twitter, uh, he uh, borrowed most of the money that he used to buy the company. Because despite the fact that he's the richest person in the world, he doesn't have a lot of cash on hand. Most of his wealth is tied up in investments in various companies. So he had to borrow the funds that he used to buy Twitter. And as a result of that, Twitter now is saddled with more than a billion dollars in interest payments per year on top of what they were already paying. And Twitter was already losing money. So Elon right now is running around trying to find uh, some way to make more money that he's able to uh, uh, be able to pay back these loans. Now, part of the problem that he's dealing with is the fact that where one of the things he wants to do is be able to charge people to uh, subscribe to Twitter, like people subscribe to different newspapers, for example. Um, and uh, to do that, though, he'd have to have that go through the Twitter app uh, on the iPhone. And Apple typically takes about 30 percent of the revenues that uh, any company makes off of uh, uh, something that is uh, create that is distributed through the uh, through the Apple Store, and uh, uh, that's for example part of the reason why uh, some of you may have experienced this. If you go and want to buy something from Amazon through the Amazon app on your iPhone, you're not able to do it. You actually you need to go then to the uh, to the browser and then purchase it through the regular website. That's because Amazon doesn't want to have to pay 30% of whatever you pay them to Apple. So similarly, uh, you've got uh, Elon Musk looking at this and saying, hey, we need more money. One way to do this is to cut out all this money that we're paying to Apple. But the problem is, is that Apple is kind of controlling the keys to the kingdom. If you can't 
get your app distributed through the Apple Store, nobody's going to have it in the first place. In fact, one of the great ironies of this situation is that when Elon Musk tweeted out these tweets attacking Apple, he tweeted them, wait for it, from an iPhone. <laughs> so he was actually using the Apple App Store app that now he's complaining about having to pay Apple for. Uh, so it's, uh, it just shows all the craziness that's going on here. There is a bigger issue, though, that I think uh, is worth noting, which is that, um, of course, we know the Apple Store has pretty serious requirements on any of the apps that are distributed through it. It's not kind of the Wild West that you'll sometimes find uh, on, the, uh, on the Android phones. And that's part of what many of us like about the iPhones, frankly. I mean, it's part of what I like about it. You know, the, the, all the apps work together. The iPhones just work. You never have to worry about anything blowing up on you. Uh, and that's because everything is designed to work together. Well, some of those requirements include things like not allowing hate speech. Uh, and uh, we just saw an example, by the way, of where um, of where Kanye West was just banned from Twitter uh, for posting a swastika. Um, now, I don't want to uh, kind of pick on Kanye West too much here or anything, but one thing that that uh, this did point out is the fact that aside from the fact that Twitter did ban Kanye West. There has actually been a huge increase, according to a study, a very large increase in hate speech on Twitter since Elon Musk took over. So it shows that there this is an issue, and my guess is that Apple's going to be watching it fairly, fairly closely. And if Elon Musk isn't able to kind of get control of uh, the out-of-control content that's uh, springing up on Twitter now, then uh, I think that you could easily see Apple starting to make suits to maybe limit them on the uh, on the App Store, which would really be the death knell of Twitter, I think. You control your app, they control their App Store. Michael, thanks for joining us as always. You got it. Thanks a lot, Twitter. <laughs> thanks a lot, Tyler. <laughs> Hey, no, we're saying I say the same thing ironically every day. I'll thanks a lot, Twitter. Another thing happened. So <laughs> no worries at all. We'll talk to you next week, Michael. Take care. Have a good one. You as well. More information on School of Business Administration programs at Oakland University can be found at oakland.edu. We'll take a break on the other side. Coming up next, we'll talk to one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform. This is the Megacast. Watch Civic Center TV with our brand new live captions. To turn on live captions, go to civiccentertv.com and click Watch Live. In your web browser, click on the Options tab in the top right and find the Accessibilities tab. Then just switch on live captions to heighten your enjoyment of our local programming. Thank you so much for watching Civic Center TV. Let's relish these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the festivals going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Wake up, Greater West Bloomfield. Start your mornings with a splash and tune in for the splash live. Get acquainted with people, places, and activities that are live, local, and for you. First thing in the morning, weekdays at 9.30 a.m. on our Civic Center TV YouTube page or watch us live at Civic Center TV or on Facebook. The Splash Live, Greater West Bloomfield's live update show. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health condition. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Welcome back to the Megacast, our live daily TV, radio, and streaming show about all things Michigan. I'm Tyler Keith. You can find more information to keep up to date with us online anytime, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. 
Joining us now on the program is one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform. Uh, Tia Russell is the founder of Take My Hand, an organization that's focused on three values, motivating, supporting, and assisting low-income and at-risk individuals and communities all throughout our local area. Tia, thank you so much for being with us today. Hey, Laker fans. It would appear we're having some technical issues. Let's take another just very short break, uh, and we'll get our bearings and come right back. This is the Megacast. I'm feeling good. Let's savor these moments, made possible by the COVID-19 vaccine. Keep the dining out going by keeping yourself protected and your COVID-19 vaccines up to date. Welcome back to the Mecca Cast again, as always. All of our programs found online on demand, civic7tv.com slash megacast. Joining us now on the Megacast, one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Shared Detroit platform, Tia Russell is the founder of Take My Hand, an organization whose mission is centered on three values, motivating, supporting, and assisting individuals in low-income and at-risk communities all throughout our local area. Tia, thank you so much for being with us today. No, oh, thank you. I'm very appreciative that you guys are welcoming me to your show. I appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming on to tell us more about Take My Hand. First off, just give us a little bit of uh, information on the history and, of course, uh, elaborate more on the mission of your organization. Yes, so Take My Hand is first is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to unite and inspire individuals to improve the quality of life by supporting, assisting, and motivating our communities for at-risk and low-income families. So we pretty much just help low-income families thrive through our program that mainly focuses on mental health, community engagement, and transportation. And so the what history it? behind it, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. And so uh, behind Take My Hand just describes me at Nature at Heart. Um, I love helping. I love giving back and making an impact. And so, you know, I'm just one person. So, you know, why not? take somebody else's hands and they can take somebody else's hands and you know it creates a domino effect to where we all can help each other to make an impact one of the key pillar programs within your organization to support that mission is your generational givers program tell us about that and why you put such a focus on volunteering okay yeah so generational givers is a youth program for the ages of 10 to 17 years of age. And so the program is to expose the te- the children to the significance of giving back. And so I created the youth program because I just want to, you know, expose them to compassion early and, you know, empathy and community responsibilities to let them see the world outside of, you know, what they're living from. Yeah, so that was my motivation. And then I started at a young age, too, and it definitely, you know, changed my aspect of the world. We're joined by Tia Russell from uh, Take My Hand on today's edition of the MegaCast. You can find more information on this organization in a couple of different places. ShareDetroit.org, go to their Find a Nonprofit section and search Take My Hand to find more information on ways you can support the organization through your time, through your donations, both financial uh, and various items, as well as other of charities and nonprofits across the state of Michigan every single day. Share Detroit.org for that, or you can go to Take My Hand's website directly for more information on how you can get involved. Take My Hand NP.com. Take My Hand NP.com. And uh, Tia, as you're addressing some of these you know, different issues that people in these situations may encounter, and you're providing these supports and interventions, a critical part of that for your organization is therapy. Tell us about your therapy programs and and how important of a role that they play in uh, providing uh, your mission and and your resources to the local community. Yes, so the program is called Therapy is Lit and the acronym is Life in Therapy. And so we connect, you know, people of the community with the therapist based on their preference. 
So we give them the mental health resources and just meet them where they're at. So we're hoping to connect them with a therapist and follow up with them to making sure that they're, you know, keeping their appointments because we know how life, you know, can hit you. So we just, you know, follow up, making sure they continue with their therapy, ensure that we're giving them the resources that they need to maintain a healthy mental health. More information, of course, can be found on their website, takemyhandnp.com. Your questions can be answered by sending them an email, info at takemyhandnp.com, or call them 248-240-8391, 248-270-8391 for more information. We're joined by Tia Russell, the founder of Take My Hand, on today's edition of the MegaCast, one of over 300 charities and nonprofits supported on the Share Detroit platform at sharedetroit.org. And uh, uh, Tia, coming up, you have the Bless a Child Christmas Takeover. How can people participate in that? And how does that also help some of these individuals that you are serving through your organization? Yes. So as you know, our main focus is low income. And so Bless a Child, we started in 2019 and it started as, as an adopted child because I feel like adopted child is more personal, you know, giving a children their actual list of what they desire. And so we created that to, you know, help families that, you know, it's hard out here during the, during the Christmas season. So we wanted to help them to, you know, give that cheer holiday spirit. Um, we actually have a, on our first homepage, you can actually, you can participate by clicking the link to become an adopter. And we also this year decided to have a toy drive. So for those who couldn't get adopted because of, you know, lack of adopters, we also are giving them an opportunity to still get blessed by us. So we're having a nice toy drive. We'll have a Santa there, hot cocoa, um, games, um, a lot of toys, a lot of free toys. So the public is open to come. Um, we are still collecting toys as well. You can actually bring the toys toys the day of. That is December 18th at 3 p.m. at the Golden Mirage. I, I can't uh, remember the address the address by hand um, by memory right now, but it's called the Golden Mirage. And it's in Dearborn Heights, and it's at 3 p.m. December 18th. You can also find more information on other ways to get involved with Take My Hand by visiting their website, takemyhandnp.com. Take My Hand NP. Dot com. Uh, Tia, a couple more minutes with you before we'll need to wrap things up for this week's MegaCasts. Uh, before we let you go, any more information on how people can get involved with your organization and help support its mission in the community? Yes. Um, so every month we are having events, monthly events called resource parties, just, you know, providing the community with resources, meeting them where they're at to meet them to the get them to that level of self-sufficiency and just succeeding. And you can get on our site. You can fill out our volunteer form sheet. You can text our number. We respond very quickly. If you would like to volunteer, we keep you updated with our events. And yeah. More information. Oh, you can always. also volunteer. You can also volunteer through Share Detroit as well. We have our opportunities on there. So that's a great site to, you know, get involved by there multiple places you can find information and ways to get involved with Take My Hand. Uh, as Tia had said, sharedetroit.org, a great place to go for this organization and over 300 other charities and nonprofits in the Metro Detroit area as well, or go directly to their website at takemyhandnp.com. Tia, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate you. TakeMyHandNP.com is their website to keep, to keep up to date with them and get involved all throughout the year. And you can also find more information on a number of different charities and nonprofits. I believe the number uh, earlier on this week was 321. They update this pretty often. And actually, it has gone up, 324 <laughs> and counting on ShareDetroit.org. Always a great place to go, especially during this holiday giving season as well. That's it for this week's editions of the MegaCast. A big programming note for next week. We're once again taking a couple of days off. We'll be on the air Monday, Tuesday, and Friday of next week. Wednesday, we have some prior commitments with the Michigan Association of Broadcasters. Stay tuned, mymytv.com for more on that. And then, of course, Thursday, we are participating once again in Mitch Album's Say Detroit Radiothons. We'll be taking the day off to help him with all of his charitable endeavors this holiday season. In the meantime, all, always online, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. That does it for this week's shows. We'll return soon with new episodes.